in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was saying you guys can share your definition of, you know, what you believe herbal medicine is, um, what recipes have been passed down to you, or how has your culture um, influenced your relationship to natural medicine? And just throw uh, an answer in the chat. You can also be like, I don't know anything about <laughs> um, That's why I'm here, Chantal. <laughs> Okay, so we've got one first response in, which is using things in nature to help your body, um, mm -hmm. using the earth to heal. Um, this person said that they grew up with herbal medicine from a Middle Eastern culture. Nice. So, okay. Yeah, and then we've got herbalism is when people use herbs or natural stuff to cure or alleviate illnesses. Exactly. Yeah, nature instead of medicine. Um, Somebody is here because they want to learn more. And somebody else says they know chamomile and they know fennel tea. So um, <laughs> they're in the right place today. We, we, have a, <laughs> we have a lot of people who are new to herbalism. Um, but we have someone who says that they've been influenced by African-American spirituality and the relationship with the land to heal, cure, and stay healthy. Um, yeah. We have someone who's learned natural medicine from her mother, who was an herbalist. Wow. Okay. okay. Hmm. Oh, who brought? Oh, sorry. Who brought her to an herbalist in a small, okay. small town? <laughs> um, yeah, and lots and lots of people who came, who are here to learn today. So you're all in the right place. Yes. Yes. That's that's really awesome. I mean, I'm gonna get into what the technical definition is, um, but Laura's gonna uh, lead us through just uh, some of the things that we need to know before we get started. Yeah, great. So we'll, we'll just start heading in. Um, welcome to the Summer Garden Series. This is our third workshop that we've done this summer. Um, and today is Herbal Care and Remedies with Chantel Kemp as our main presenter today. We've got Kristen Fields here, uh, Grow NYC School Gardens Director, who's gonna help moderate the chat and our Q&A, which will happen at the end of the workshop. And I'm Laura Casaragola. I'm helping out today as well. These are past workshops that we've had and the other ones we have coming up this summer. So if you missed Grow Garden from Food Scraps or Rat Mitigation in Gardens, you can find that on growNYCdistancelearning.org. Today is Herbal Care and Remedies. In two weeks, I'll be leading um, a workshop on container gardening where I'll go over methods and best practices for indoor and outdoor container gardening. And Wednesday, August 19th, um, another two weeks after that, is gardening with kids. Um, so make sure you sign up on our Eventbrite, same way you signed up for these ones, for the upcoming workshops. And yes, we are recording. There's so many questions yes. in the chat. We are recording, and it'll be on that distance learning page tonight. We will email it to you after the presentation as well. So yes, we are recording. Yeah. Um, during the workshop today, you can submit questions using the Q&A Zoom function. So look at the bottom of your screen at your Zoom toolbar, and there's a Q&A function, and that's the best place to submit your questions. Um, you can still message us through the chat, but it's easier for us to filter through the questions if you put it in the actual Q&A. Uh, all your mics will be muted for this, but again, if you have some, some comments, make sure you can message us through the chat. As Kristen said, we'll be recording the workshop and you'll get a follow-up email after today, after today's mm -hmm. workshop. Um, so a quick disclaimer before we get into the main presentation. Um, we're going to be going over some different methods for herbal remedies, um, but this shouldn't replace any doctor-approved treatment plan that you're currently following. A lot of times people use these as a complementary treatment, um, but definitely talk to your doctor about your own individual case um, how it interacts with your current medications or things like that. Um, you just want to make sure you talk to a doctor about that. Also, um, we always recommend if you're growing your own herbs or if you know where your herbs are coming from, um, if you're making your own remedies. Uh, when you go to like a health food store, an herbalist store, you buy things from, from uh, a manufacturer that come in capsules or powders or commercially prepared, it can um, have other additional things into it. So make sure you're reading your labels, you know where it's coming from. And keep in mind that the FDA doesn't actually uh, monitor herbal supplements. So you just want to make sure you know what you're putting into your body. 
And I will now pass it over to Chantel to give us a little intro. Yes, so thank you so much, Laura. I think that uh, disclaimer uh, was definitely necessary and needed. We wanna make sure that everyone is being safe um, and just letting everybody know that re regardless of what you use or, or how you use it, you always wanna go back to how it affects your body, what is your body telling you, what are the signs, what are the signals, and dosage um, and products are gonna vary from person to person. So one person's experience may not be your experience, so just using that um, to kind of set you up for the greatest results. Um, and Laura's gonna take us through the next slide where we're gonna talk about all the things that we're gonna get into today. Yeah, so today's agenda, we're gonna go over just a general overview of herbalism and herbal care and remedies. We're gonna go over a few different herbs and their properties and what they can be used, um, how they can be used as treatments and for which types of discomforts or, or ailments. We're gonna go over fresh versus dried herbs and processes for drying out your herbs if you do wanna dry them before turning them into anything. Um, Chantel's gonna show us how to make uh, herbal infused oils at home. And so we have a couple different methods for that. And then we're going to go into how you can use those herbal oils that you've made in different types of sprays, scrubs, potpourri, or other things you can make at home. Um, and then to wrap it all up at the end, we'll go turn inwards and see and think about how herbal care and remedies affects us inwardly as well. Um, so I saw in the chat a lot of people were saying they, their experience with herbal care involves a lot of tea and things like that. And I think that's a really common one. So what we want to try to do today was bring you stuff that goes beyond tea um, and to different types of products and things that you can make. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think we all know how to make tea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But yeah, we're going to go over some different types of products. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I've asked you all what you thought about herbalism or what your definition of herbalism were. And you all have really great answers. So uh, the technical term for herbalism or herbal medicine is just the study of botany and the use of medicinal plants. And we see today, even in Western medicine, pharmaceutical companies, they currently have a long history of using herbal remedies. So they use things such as opium and aspirin. And even as we go across cultures, when we talk about indigenous culture, we talk about African culture, Chinese, Middle Eastern, Greek, Roman, Indian culture, we see that a lot of um, all of our cultures have directly used natural medicine to treat ailments and treat diseases. Um, and Laura's going to take us through uh, reasons to research and how we would go about that because we're only going to be touching on a few herbs today. Yeah, the, uh, the first draft of, the, of this presentation that Chantel made had so much information about all these different kinds of herbs and amazing things that they can do and all these long lists. It was so much knowledge, but we couldn't get through it all in an hour. Right. So we did have to cut some of that stuff out, um, but we wanted to leave you with some guiding research questions so that you can take what you learned today and apply it to other herbs that you do wanna use. And so to guide your research as you go forward, you want to first know what are the herbs properties? How do you properly prepare it? Do you, do you eat it raw? Do you have to boil it? You know, some things can be toxic if you have it raw, but once you prepare it the proper way, it's actually medicinal, but you want to make sure you know the difference between that. Um, what quantity is safe to consume? Even with um, like natural remedies like ginger, you don't want to consume five pounds of ginger in a day. That's not going to actually be good for your body. So wanting to know how much is safe to consume in a day um, and also for your, for your age level um, or body weight. And then will it interact with other medicine that you take? For example, I'm on a type of medicine where I'm not supposed to have St. John's wort, which is a natural remedy, but I need to know that so that I can avoid it. Um, whereas a lot of other natural remedies are fine with me. Um, you wanna know what part of the plant do I use when you're making something uh, for example, here on the left, we have an echinacea flower or purple cone flower, which is a native plant and it's used, you know, maybe you've had cough drops with echinacea in it, but you're not just going to go and, and pick the flower and eat all the pollen inside of it. That's not going to actually help you. So you want to know which part of the plant do you use, how do you prepare it? 
Um, and then also to guide your research, you always want to know and, and find out what cultures have a history of using this herb and how can you use and support their knowledge respectfully. Right, exactly. So we're doing something um, that has been hand down traditionally through a specific culture. We do want to acknowledge that and use their research so that way, you know, we use it to the best, to the to get the best results, right? You don't want to ignore or try to reinvent the wheel here. <laughs> yeah, or if you're looking to support businesses, finding one that's really linked to that ancestral knowledge, always good stuff. Right. Um, and we're going to lead us through some of the herbs and, and their properties. Yeah, so this is just a very general overview. Um, but these are some of like the more common herbal supplements and their properties. So if you're looking for sleep and relaxation aids, a lot of times you can look to chamomile, lavender, valerian, and tulsi. Tulsi is a relative of basil. And speaking of, of chamomile, if anyone here has had like the sleepy time tea, um, is kind of like a popular tea blend for, for sleep and relaxation. And that contains, I believe, like chamomile and mint and things like that. Um, if you're looking to boost your immune system, echinacea, ginger, elderberry, and anisotisap are good things. Um, some, some things that help with stomach and nausea are ginger, mint, basil, and fennel. Someone, I think, mentioned fennel tea at the beginning in the chat. Um, and then for headaches, some things that can be very soothing are lemon balm, rosemary, catnip, vervain, also known as verbena. Um, and this is obviously not an exhaustive list. And the other funny thing is that a lot of these herbs can help with both sleep and relaxation and headaches, or they can, they can help with your stomach pain and also maybe boost your immune system at the same time. Um, and a reason for that is a lot of these herbal remedies, their, their main cause is to help with inflammation, help reduce inflammation in the body. Because inflammation is actually um, one of the most common causes for physical discomfort or just for a lot of chronic illnesses or even temporary ailments have to do with inflammation. So that's why a lot of these actually overlap and help with multiple things in a more holistic sense of healing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like we said, obviously we won't be going over all the herbs you know mentioned but we will be going over multiple methods for using herbs and then you can do your own research and decide which herbs that you want to use based on their specific properties um so here we're going to talk a little bit about trauma relief and how we can use herbs to help us with that and so um what is trauma, right? So psychological trauma is damage to the mind that, that occurs at the result of a distressing event. And trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds one's ability to cope or integrate their emotions involved with that experience. And so a couple examples I can think of of trauma is COVID-19 and the stress that it has put on all of us and trying to deal with, you know, not having that same level of quality of life as before or the Black Lives Matter protests um, that have been, you know, going on throughout the country and throughout the world and dealing with that stress. And so we can use a lot of herbs and herbal remedies in order to help us deal with some of these events. For instance, we have lavender, which I know really helps me with my insomnia. I have like some dried lavender, put it in a satchel underneath my pillow, and I'm good, I'm good to go for the night. Um, we also have holy basil that can be very um, great for clearing out unwanted energy. So maybe that, you know, toxic family member wants to come over and stress you out when they leave, <laughs> maybe having that holy basil to like purify the space or getting white sage. Um, those are things that we can do to kind of recheck back in and get back to the mental space where we're talking about self-care. Um, another thing is lemon balm, which I feel is undervalued when we talk about herbalism. A lot of people talk about chamomile, they talk about echinacea, they talk about eucalyptus, but lemon balm kind of gets thrown to the wayside. And it's actually really great when we talk about um, depression or 
sadness or grief. And so you could use it in a calming spray or you can even use it in a tea. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about lemon balm today. That's one of the herbs that I picked. Um, and, and how we can use it for some of these um, benefits. So here, lemon balm has so many benefits, so many great properties. Um, it's said to soothe symptoms of stress, you know, help you relax, boost your mood. Um, it also can help reduce symptoms of anxiety. So nervousness, excitability. I'm a little bit nervous. Maybe I should have had some lemon balm before this. <laughs> before this presentation, right? Um, also for us ladies who have frequent abdom abdominal pain um, and discomfort, it can have a positive you know, um, impact on your digestive system. So helping relieve menstrual cramps, helping um, with you know, PMS, which a lot of us deal with, and also helping with nausea, right? And so I think that that's something that can really get us out of the habit of using some of these commercial products such as like Tums and whatever other stuff. I only know Tums. I don't really know the other ones, but <laughs> you know, get us out of using some of these commercial products and get us to, you know, ingest some of these natural um, remedies. It also says that um, lemon balm is also great when we talk about treating headaches, especially headaches that are stress related. And I know a lot of us were like on the screen all day, you know, feel like trapped inside or we go outside and there's a lot of drama going on. So we're getting stressed out, we're getting headaches. And so, you know, smelling lemon balm, ingesting it, having it in tea, that can be a great way where we could relieve some of these headaches. And then last but certainly not least is talking about toothaches, which I feel is kind of under, you know, talked about, but Toothaches can be very painful and very disruptive. Um, and if you don't want to go to the store and, and buy that gel that you kind of put in your mouth and it numbs it for like five seconds and then it starts hurting again, um, you know, lemon balm can be a great way to kind of relieve that pain. And like I said before, really um, taking it in doses, really seeing how your body is going to react to it um, and testing it out, that's going to get you the best results. Um, and here in the next slide, we go into talking about fresh herbs versus dry herbs. And this is all leading us up to herbal oils, but it also um, can be used when we're talking about different products. So depending on the product that you're making, you might want your herbs to be fresh. You might want them to be dry. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to really talk about using dry herbs just because it's better for beginners, uh, <laughs> it's less likely to mold or become rancid, it's more shelf stable, it's more available to us, and it's also more potent and concentrated, right? Um, fresh herbs, they have a varying shelf life. You generally have to pick them right before you use them, so that means you have to have a plant indoors or go to the green market to get fresh herbs and it's also more likely to mold or become rancid and that's just because it has a higher water content and so you know as we're first starting out and you know we want some quick victories let's just go for you know the least possible friction and do something that's a little bit easier to handle and in the next slide we have some drying techniques um, and so we have the bunching and hanging technique, which is really cool. I have this little, uh, this little bunching and hanging thing that I did in my house. Um, I had some geranium leaves and I decided that I wanted to dry them. I didn't want to do it in the oven because it's hot. Um, and I want to make some potpourri. And the reason why I love geranium leaves is because you know, not a lot of people talk about them, but they actually smell a lot like roses. And so I get the rose smell without having to pay for roses. So that's a really great tip. Um, <laughs> so the bunching and hanging technique is the original, right? Um, you just take it, you bunch it together, you might get a rubber band, you should get a rubber band and put it around because as it dries, the stems, they shrink. And if you don't have the rubber band, then it kind of just falls everywhere. And then you're like in your closet trying to pick up dry leaves. It's, it's not cute. Um, don't blame me. Uh, use the rubber band. <laughs> that did happen to me, but it was before I knew you, Chantel. <laughs> 
<laughs> so use the rubber band. It's definitely going to save you some energy. Um, you can put it in your closet. You can put it in your basement. You can put it in your attic. You can even put it in a brown paper bag as long as it's in a cool or a dry spot um, and come back to it in like a week or so and you'll be good to go. The second technique is microwave drying, which I thought was so cool because I never knew that you could dry herbs in the microwave. So for those of us that are still using microwaves and are not afraid of, you know, the rays and stuff that they be telling us about, um, <laughs> all you have to do is um, wash the leaves that you want to use or whatever parts of the herb that you want to use, put it in between two paper towels and then microwave it for like a minute. If it needs some extra time, put an extra 30 seconds and you're good to go. Um, and you know that it's ready because as soon as you touch it, it kind of crumbles in your hands. The third one is the dehydrator. I don't have a dehydrator. Maybe you guys have a dehydrator. But if you do, um, you do the same thing with the microwave technique as you clean it. Uh, you want to cook it at the lowest possible setting for about two to four hours. And then you want to remove the herbs, maybe put it over like a clean cloth or a bowl. That way you can get all the little bits and, you know, be able to get the maximum amount of herbs, right? Um, and then last but certainly not least is oven drying, right? So maybe this is for some of us that are working at home and we just want to just throw something in there and then go about our day and then come back and check on it. Um, so it's best like if you have like muslin or you have cheesecloth, you kind of put that, the pluck leaves on that. Um, so that way they won't stick to the baking pan. You can also use like a silicone mat and then set it on like the lowest possible setting. Um, probably not broil, but like the lowest for bake and then have it sit for like 30 minutes. So just set a timer, come back to it. And then after that, you can store it in like a glass jar with a lid, airtight is best. And now you have some dry herbs. And um, in the next slide is- some I will, picture. really quickly, I, I just wanna put in a, something I read about microwave drying herbs, which yeah. is make sure you do small increments because if you go too long, they can actually like burst into fire. So- Oh, wow. Do very, like you can do 30 seconds at first and then feel them and then do 20 seconds and feel it and then 10 seconds and, and feel it because you don't want any flames. Okay, got you. That makes sense. <laughs> uh, so here's a picture of just how the herbs look fresh and then how they look dry for all of us visual learners. Um, and now we're going to get into the herbal infused oils. And I've chosen to focus on herbal infused oils versus essential oils. But I have added a resource on how you can make essential oils at home. It requires some more equipment, uh, some more technical stuff, you know, and, you know, you can do your own research on how to do that. But, you know, herbal infused oils are really great. They're often used to ease stress, to boost mood, to relieve pain from headaches and migraines and insomnia. They help with nausea. And people even use them to repel insects. So most herbal oils have some antiseptic properties. And what that just means is that antiseptics are substances that help to stop to the growth of like microorganisms on the skin. So is used in daily like medical settings to reduce the risk of infection and stop the spread of germs. So, you know, this is all really going to depend on what herbs you use. And it's also going to depend on something that you need to make these herbal oils, which is a carrier oil. So if we move over to the next slide, we're talking about how you can choose your carrier oil. And carrier oils are just used to dilute and carry, you know, the oils to your skin. So most carrier oils are unscented um, or lightly scented, and they may be used alone or with other oils. So it just depends on, you know, what you want, how the oils react to your skin, um, and what the purpose of it is. I have a whole list of carrier oils there. I will say that you might want to avoid using rose hip oil or coconut oil because they decant too easily. And decanting is just allowing a mixture of solid and liquid to settle and separate by gravity. And so if it doesn't, if it's not going to um, really sit 
before it separates, then that means that it, there won't be an infusion. There will just be oil and some like herb particles in it. And that's weird, right? Um, <laughs> so if you want at the end, after you have infused your oil and you're like, I really love rose hip oil or I really love coconut oil, you can add it at the end. Um, and now we're going to go over one of the techniques. Laura is gonna lead us through this part. Yeah, and I'll also say we are going to be putting all these recipes that we're going over and even like the lists and stuff that you've seen on our slides, that'll all be part of the blog post that you'll get after this workshop. So you don't have to screenshot or try to take notes furiously right now. We're going to describe the process, but you'll have these notes later in the blog post to look back on. Um, so the first way that we're going to go over how to infuse your oils with herbs is a cold infusion method. For this cold infusion method, it works best with dry herbs, especially if you're a beginner, you're just trying this out for the first time, um, and you're gonna do the cold infusion, we recommend using dry herbs. Again, it's just easier with the water balance and things like that. So what you're gonna need, um, you'll choose your, your dry herbs, you'll choose one of the carrier oils that was mentioned in the previous slide. Um, you'll need a mason jar or a Pyrex bowl. So we want something that not plastic because we don't want the plastic to leach in there either. So um, Pyrex or glass is best. A cheesecloth, which you're gonna use to filter out the herb at the end, and then a cobalt jar or um, a colored jar that can protect from UV damage. And so you've probably seen, if you ever see like tinctures or things, um, they're always in these little brown or blue jars, glass jars, those are best for storing your herbs so that they um, don't get damaged. So what you're gonna do is place the dry herbs in a sterilized glass jar and you're gonna fill it about halfway with the dry herb and then you're gonna fill up the rest of the jar with um, your oil of choice, with your carrier oil. Then all you have to do is just kind of place your jar in a sunny but not too hot location and um, we're not gonna add any additional heat to it but just the regular heat from your room temperature is actually fine to start that infusion process. Um, you're going to want to label the jar with the date that you put it in there and what herbs you have in there as well. Um, and then you're just going to wait four to six weeks uh, until uh, you're ready to filter out the herbs. And so in order to filter out the herbs, you'll use a fine mesh filter or a strainer. Um, lay your cheesecloth over that as well. And then you're going to just pour the contents of your jar through that. That'll catch all of the herb particles. Um, but all the oil will go through and then you can put all of that finished oil um, herbal infused oil into a protective cobalt or brown colored jar um, and then if you want to extend the shelf life of uh, your herbal infusion um, you can add a few drops of vitamin e oil myrrh or rosemary essential oil um, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, um, and, and you know, like Laura said, this is going to take uh, four to six weeks. Um, I see somebody in the chat like, can we talk about quantities? It really is going to depend on the size of your jar. So however big your jar is, halfway with the herbs, halfway with the, um, with the oil. Um, and I'll get to the rest of you guys' questions later. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next um, method is the hot infusion method. This is for all my folks that love instant gratification, like me, want to get the project done and over with. Um, this one can be done in 12 to 24 hours. Um, so you're going to have you know, your sanitized jar. You're going to have your oils. You're going to have your herbs. And then you're going to have a double boiler you're gonna need your cheesecloth and you're gonna need your cobra jar. So basically everything else that you need it, but just including a double boiler. Um, and same method, the only thing is that, you know, you're going to have the water steaming, but not simmering or boiling. And then you're gonna place the jar um, into the water, making sure that there's no water to get into the jar or the bowl. And so, you know, 
and just allow it to sit in that warm bath for like 12 to 24 hours, making sure like that the water never runs low or it gets too hot. If it gets too hot, it will crack the glass or it will just burn the herbs. And then afterwards, you're going to allow it to cool to room temperature, and then you're going to strain and store the same way you did in the cold infusion method. Um, and so this one I like just because you can use fresh or dry herbs for the hot infusion method, and that's just because you're exposing it to heat. So the water content is not an issue for this particular method. And in the next picture, we have just what it will look like when you put it in the double boiler. Obviously, you know, you could have the oil all the way up to the top. It depends on how concentrated you want it to be. And in the cold infusion method there, we see that it has decanted and the herbs have separated from the oil. So this is probably about the time where you'd be thinking about um, straining or leaving in for an extra week or so just to really get that herbal infusion that you want. And now we're going to move on to some of the great things that we can, um, uh, some of the great things that we can use these herbal infused oils for. So, you know, uh, we have like our herb water, we have the calming spray that we're gonna go over, we have bath scrubs, we have potpourri. So th these are all going to be really, really cool. Um, and, you know, a lot of people already use herbs for culinary benefits. So like we understand like the culture and the health benefits. So these are just ways that, you know, we can explore herbs in different ways. And so, um, Laura, do you want to take us through this, this herb water? Yeah. So this first one, it actually doesn't involve any oils. And we wanted to include this because we know we have a lot of school gardeners um, tuning in today. Uh, or even if you're just doing stuff with gardening with kids in any way or people with allergies and you're not sure about using oils around them. Um, something super easy that you can do as a really quick fun garden activity and a way to kind of calm everyone and bring everyone into the space is making a little herb water or uh, sometimes the kids will call it herb perfume or garden perfume or something like that and it's kind of a fun way to and a fun and easy way to explore the uh, different sensory factors of herbs, um, but you don't have to worry about the mess or like staining people's clothes with oil and sending them home with that. Um, so you can actually just rip up little pieces of herbs and put them in water and like smell them together. You can feel them um, and then put it in a spray bottle if you, if you have one of those and just like spray it around. Um, that's kind of just a fun grounding activity to do, um, especially with youth. We do want to make sure we clean out the uh, clean out the spray bottle every time because we're using fresh herbs and water, so it will get moldy if you don't clean it out. Um, but that's just a quick fun activity. Yeah, it sounds cool. It sounds cool. Like uh, welcome to the garden, spray spray. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a little like ritual to get everyone into the spirit. Yeah, I love that. Um, this one we got this recipe from our lovely director Kristen on how to make a calming spray. This one you need a little bit more ingredients. Um, you need some water. You can use distilled water if you want. You need witch hazel. Um, and then you can use a various of uh, essential oils, lavender or eucalyptus, and you can add more or less depending on how strong you want the spray to be. And, you know, mix it all, put it in a brown glass spray bottle. We've been talking about the cobalt jars and the spray bottles to protect it against the UV rays. So that basically applies to most things, uh, I think except for like the herb water, because you're going to kind of dispose of that. Um, pretty pretty quickly, but anything you want to keep for a period of time, you want to make sure that you're protecting it from the UVs. Um, and some benefits is like you know these stress, anxiety, depression, boosts you know feelings of relaxation, helps improve your sleep. And this is also can be used when we talk about um, quality of life or long term health problems for people that have like dementia or you know have Alzheimer's so maybe having that person smell specific herbs and see how they react to it and whatever herbs kind of calm them then making a calming spray out of that or using essential oils that they might actually respond to so I think that that's really amazing 
Um, the next one we're going to be talking about is making a bath and body scrub, which I love because I don't like to spend a lot of money on self-care products. Um, I also don't like to spend a lot of money on gifts. So these are really <laughs> great homemade, <laughs> homemade gifts. Um, you know, the holidays are, are not too far away. So, you know, I could <laughs> make some what bath holidays? and body scrubs and give them out as gifts. You know, hint, hint, Laura and Kristen, which bath and body scrub do you like? Um, <laughs> so you don't need a lot of ingredients. Um, you can use Epsom salt. I would say use the unscented one, depending on you know uh, how sensitive your skin is, or you can use sugar, so like organic cane sugar, brown sugar, or just regular granulated sugar. It just depends on you and, and you, what kind of sugar you want to be on your skin. Um, you would have your cup of carrier oil, and like we said, you could choose with whatever oil is going to respond best to your skin and to your specific needs. And then eight to 10 drops of like your favorite essential oil or maybe using some of the herbal infused oils, right? And so maybe if you want to get a little bit more fancy and you want to recreate some of these smells that, you know, we, we see in like Bath and Body Works and Bed Bath and Beyond or whatever, we might make a warm vanilla sugar body scrub, right? Just adding two teaspoons of vanilla extract or adding some nutmeg to it. We could get, you know, we could we could really, you know, play around with uh, this body scrub idea because it's really about self-care. Um, you can also add like one tablespoon of like lemon zest if you want like a lemon salt body scrub or one teaspoon or of uh, grapefruit zest. And, you know, Kristen told me that the, the rind from some of these citrus fruits are really great for like exfoliant. So it's just an extra added luxury of exfoliation. Uh, so I thought that was all really great uh, for like self-care, taking care of oneself, taking some time to really like, you know, love on you, be on you. And this, uh, this body scrub can help you with that. Um, and I know some people might want to use olive oil um, for some of these things, just understanding that it, it can have a strong scent so maybe using extra virgin olive oil if you want something that's a little bit lighter and thin. And just, you know, figuring out what you want the fragrance to be, how strong you want it to be, how light you want it to be. And the next one is our herbal potpourri. I told you guys at the beginning of this workshop, I'm definitely making a potpourri. Um, <laughs> and I use the, the bunching and hanging um, technique versus using the oven but feel free to kind of mix it up and do whatever sits best for you. Um, this one, you can use flowers, you can use fresh herbs, um, you would need a sheet pan, you would need parchment paper, scissors, some type of bowl that you're gonna put the potpourri in or some type of satchel. You can use your essential oils or you can use your herbal oils. You're gonna need a spray bottle. You can also use like citrus fruits if you're not allergic or different like whole spices. So you would just preheat the oven to 200 degrees. You would gather your flowers, your herbs. You would cover the sheet tray with some type of parchment paper. And then you would just cut off like whatever you want your potpourri to be made of. So it could be flower heads. It could be um, cutting thin slices of citrus fruits. Um, it could be, you know, springs of rosemary and, and lavender and thyme. It could be, you know, adding in cinnamon sticks and cloves and all spices. And then afterwards, you're going to add like 10 to 15 drops of like your essential oil or your herbal oil with a, tea, with a tablespoon of water and like a small spray bottle and then spritz it. Dry it in the oven for like two hours or until the flowers are a bit dry but not brittle. And then once it's room temperature, you like gently mix it all together and place it in a bowl or a small satchel. And then if you wanted to smell extra, you know, you can feel free to add more drops of essential oil. And this is a great way for us to get out of using um, air freshener that has a lot of harmful chemicals. Um, it has a lot of VOCs, and also it looks really nice in your bathroom, just having like a nice bowl of potpourri, and then you'd be able to kind of stunt on your family members, like, yeah, I made that. Um, 
<laughs> so, you know, that's also a, a really great way to kind of use some of the herbs or use some flowers. I was using geranium leaves, to, you know, just use things that you have in the house. Um, and so far, we talked a lot about all of the outward stuff. We talked about all the different techniques. We talked about benefits and properties. We talked about all the really cool gifts that you could give me for Christmas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and now um, we're going to take some time and bring it inward, which I feel um, is really important. So one thing that we can do is setting intentions. And a part of setting intentions we're already going to be do already going to be doing within the process of making some of these things. So making a label, um, we have to label all our products. We have to put the date. We have to put the ingredients for the safety of ourselves and our family members, just in case they want to use it. They may be allergic to something, so making sure that we put the ingredients. We have to put the name of it um, if it's going to be flower bomb scent 3000 whatever that name is going to be um and then the purpose and so i think the purpose is really important the purpose is saying what is this product supposed to do how is it supposed to make me feel and this idea of setting intentions directly aligns with the idea of the placebo effect right so if we believe that it will work then it will work right and so when we set these intentions, what we're telling ourselves um, is that this calming spray is going to relax me, it's going to you know, relieve my stress, it's going to allow me to take time and focus on me. And when we spray that spray, that's exactly what it's going to do. So setting ourselves up for the best possible results by setting intentions. Um, the second thing that we can do, and these things can be done in conjunction with each other. They can be done separately. You could be like, I'm not going to do any of it, but I'm just giving you the information. Um, the second thing that can be done is prayer. And so prayer is going to look differently for everyone. There are different types of prayer. There is a spiritual prayer where you might be praying to ancestors. You might be praying to the universe. You might be praying to earth. You, um, or you might be, you know, using a religious prayer where you're praying to your God or a specific God. And that's going to look differently. So I don't have a set prayer. Um, and, you know, a lot of cultures believe in the power of prayer when it comes to blessings, when it comes to healing oneself. So maybe you want to use prayer if you're using, um, if you're making something that is for another person to help with their ailment, or it's for you to help with a physical or, or a mental ailment that you're going through. And, you know, like I said, prayer is going to look differently. And so all you would really do is ask whomever you are praying to or whatever you are praying to, to really guide you and to really make whatever this product is purposeful, to help it heal you, to help it, you know, um, relieve some tension, relieve some stress, and 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 really get you to a place of, of self-awareness and to a better place than what you were before. And then the third thing is meditation. And a lot of us have kind of subscribed to meditation as a great way to center ourselves, as a great way to, you know, exercise and, you know, exercise uh, relieves a lot of endorphins, which makes you happy. Um, also a great way to connect with yourself, to stay grounded, to take, to take a second and stop and really focus on you. And we can use some of the practices in meditation in order to create mind maps, right? And so we all know that sensory is a really, is, is so strong, right? Smelling something that, you know, your mom cooked when you were five takes you back to that moment when she was in the kitchen and she wore her apron and she was wearing this thing. You're like, oh my God, I feel like it was just yesterday that you cooked this thing for me. And so we can use those mind maps in order to kind of trick our brains into doing what we want it to do. And what that might look like is that when you begin your medita med meditation session, you have your bath scrub, say for instance, 
and you smell it and then you meditate and then you in your meditation and you smell it again and so what that will tell your body when you're using it is that when i use this i am relaxed and i am relaxed because i use this that mental association is going to help us get the best results so really using scent as a memory enhancer for a peaceful moment and you know it can be a it could be a combination of things it could be one thing but try it out and see how it works for you and i think that is all <laughs> okay we have we have so many questions um <laughs> people were really paying attention throughout um we had one of our first questions was about the fact that there's so much conflicting info online and so they were asking if there were some recommended reading. So the answer to that is yes, we have some, um, some free resources for you that we're going to put when we send out the, the follow up with this recording. We're also going to have some places that you can look up the different usages of herbs. So yes. Um, somebody was also asking how you can tell the difference between mint and lemon balm, which I thought was a fun question. I can take that if you guys. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's so many different types of mint, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can take it, Kristen. Yeah, I mean, my favorite lemon balm smells lemony, and so if you're in the store, if you're in the garden, and you you do the pinch, like where you rub the leaves between your fingers, and then you smell, like it'll have a very lemony. Yeah, some people are saying it also has like a soapiness to it. It tastes a little mm -hmm. soapy. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, and then also like if you do the same, that same like rub test with mint, it's going to smell like, like mint, like gum. So I would, that's the way I would, I would do it. That's yeah, a really absolutely. good question because lemon balm and mint are from the same family. Yeah. So they exactly. all have like a square stem. So I can see why it would be, it, it's hard to tell the difference if you're not. Totally. Especially it. when it's like a young plant too. Like it needs to, exactly. it like needs to like establish that smell, like as lemon balm gets bigger like a I had a lemon balm plant I mean the leaves were enormous like it was definitely clearer as it got but I would also say lemon balm has a bit more of a different like a more yellowy green I yeah would, I don't know if that's just my association because it has the word lemon in it but <laughs> <laughs> but I swear by the smell on that one yeah um we had some questions about how do you extend the shelf life of the oils and if you don't extend the shelf life, how, how long can you expect these to keep? So it's going to depend on what the expiration date of the carrier oil you're using. Um, it's also going to depend whether or not you use fresh or dry herbs. So, you know, traditionally, it takes a really long time for oil to be to go bad or be bad or expire. Um, so I think in that regard, just making sure that you're checking the expiration date um, you also we talked about using myrrh or using um, vitamin E oil or using rosemary oil. And I know some of you guys were like, what's the dosage for that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so you're going to have to experiment a little bit. And what I would say is like, you know, maybe putting a few drops of the rosemary essential oil in it and seeing if it extends or, you know, um, doing some more research and seeing how long do these actually, you know, expand, expand the, the shelf life for some of these infused oils? Yeah, I, yeah and I, I make a lot of like, I, I have, you, I don't know if you, Chantal and Lauren know this, like I have a lot of problems with like shelf products from the store. So I make a lot of like makeup remover and like things like that, just because it's, they're, they're less irritating to make. Mm -hmm. um, but I use coconut oil a lot as the base because it's not irritating to my skin. And I have like my husband, bless him, like he's very tolerant of the, the little tiny jars in the medicine cabinet. <laughs> um, but I've actually never had, um, I usually run out before they go bad. Um, yeah. So when people are asking, yeah, it's all it is, is um, almond oil or coconut oil. That's it. And then a little witch hazel to take makeup off. That's all. Um, and then it's, we have a question about um, when you're, when you're doing the hot infusion method. Yeah. 
do you cover the jars or do you leave them open? The pictures were open. So people. So yeah, like, you could leave yeah. them open. Um, that's why I was like, make sure that the water doesn't get into the oil um, that's in the jar. So you could traditionally leave them open. Cool. And you would want them to be able to like steam. You wouldn't want to trap yeah. that in there. Yeah, because then the it would be too much, the heat, and then it would just crack the glass and yeah. explode from the inside. Right. So. People were also asking if they could use a slow cooker for the hot infusion. Yeah, you yeah. can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can yeah. use a slow cooker, a crock pot, whatever you got. Your house would smell so nice when that's... Right? <laughs> <laughs> but they did say make sure that you use whatever pot that you use for it, make sure that you're not going to use it for food afterwards, so... Oh yeah, yeah. It'll it'll smell. You'll know that you yeah. did something in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> people are are they're asking? Do you use the stems and leaves in the hot and cold infusions? Um, you can if you want to. Traditionally, people just use uh, the leaves. They don't really use the stems. Um, so it just depends on 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 what you want. I know a lot of people. Sub, uh, subscribe to using stems because it has the most, it has all the nutrients there. So if you want to cut them up um, to use them, you can. Um, there was also a question about vanilla extract versus vanilla essential oil and what the difference is between an extract and an essential oil. Which well, I well, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, well, the extract is, is traditionally used for cooking. Um, so, you know, you could bake with it. And then the essential oil, you know, has been, you know, steamed and, and pressed to get all the oils from, the, you know, the vanilla bean plant. So that's really just the difference. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't consume a vanilla essential oil, but no. you could consume <laughs> the extract. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And with like the extract you use, usually it's alcohol that they use to like extract out the so there tends to be some more like what we would volatile um, yeah. oils that come out with that. So, um, I mean, like you could, you could put it in a candle or something. If you were making a candle, you probably, you could use it, but like, yeah, yeah don't eat essential oils. <laughs> yeah. I would say only use the essential oil on something um, that you're going to like put on your skin, but never anything that you're going to like consume or use as a dosage. Right. And, and also anything you're going to put on your skin, like it's good to test it on the inside of your wrist, just, mm -hmm. you know, a day, two days, three days, especially if you're sensitive to stuff, just to make sure that it doesn't give you a, um, <laughs> a oh, reaction. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be in the tub with the whole thing on me, <laughs> figure <no>. out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, people were asking about coconut oil again. Um, mm -hmm. That was a popular one. Maybe we'll just go through the reason why we left coconut oil off that list of carrier oils. But yeah, I, I left it off just because from the research that I did, it was saying that um, coconut oil and uh, rosehip oil particularly, they decant too easily. And so you're not going to get that infusion um, of the oils and the herbs together. But you can always feel free to use a different carrier oil and then add in some coconut oil at the end if you really like the smell of it or you know like Kristen said it's really great for your skin um so <laughs> yeah great for my skin I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> um someone is asking how do you know if your infused oil has gone bad how do you know if it's gone bad I think you would know it would it would smell um you wouldn't like the smell of it it would be rancid. It would change it, color. Yeah. It, yeah. You would know. Yeah. It, <laughs> exactly. And, and especially if like you didn't get all the little bits out when you, um, when you strained it, yeah. like that's what's going to turn first. So yeah. you'll see spots too. Um, how do, how do we know if the oil doesn't work anymore? Um, mm. well, you know, that's, I think that's difficult um, to know. I think it's going to vary depending on the concentration of like how strong it was or, you know, how light the scent was. 
I think after a certain period of time, things tend to lose their scent. Yeah. So once it doesn't hold that same scent as when you first made it, maybe then it's time to, to make a new one. Yeah, and it depends what you're using. Like if you notice that it's like, it used to have a desired effect on you, maybe then you've gotten used to it and it's time to like bump it up or change it a little bit. So um, yes, you can revisit the Zoom as a recording. We are gonna have this live. It's gonna be on growmitdistancelearning.org a little, mm -hmm. just, you know, later this afternoon, we're also gonna send it to you. Yeah. And we have lots of recipes and we have lots of like resource guides for you as well. So that is coming. Um, this feels like a good place to stop for questions, but just special shout out. Someone put in the chat that we are so cute and we should have a YouTube channel. So thank uh -huh. you for that. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we will have, we'll have all that info out to you later. We hope you'll revisit it. Let us know if you've tried any of this. If you want to send us, like our emails are here. If you want to send us your recipes for things that you use, we can add it to our um, resource that gets shared out. So we definitely love learning all the ways that you're using um, herbs and plants. And and oh, there was one more. No, it is not too late to grow things on your to grow herbs on your window. So not at all. And there's <laughs> on that distance learning page. There's some guides there too. So we hope you'll check those out. Um, so thank you to Chantelle and Laura for leading today. Thank you for everyone for tuning in. Um, and we'll see you in two weeks for container gardening. Yes, growing we're herbs, gonna, growing herbs and container about herbs, right? And, and <laughs> part of that. So we'll see right. you in two weeks. <laughs> so hopefully we, we've inspired you to, to grow and we'll show you how in two weeks. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.